Welcome to the Relationship Recovery Podcast, hosted by Jessica Knight, a certified life coach who specializes in narcissistic and emotional abuse. This podcast is intended to help you identify manipulative and abusive behavior, set boundaries with yourself and others, and heal the relationship with yourself so you can learn to love in a healthy way. Hello, and thank you so much for being here. Today, I have a special guest. She's been here twice before, Emmy Marie, whose Instagram is blooming with Emmy. Emmy is a coach that works with people who are healing from the effects of emotional abuse or abusive relationships. And as she'll name in this podcast, she typically works with people that are beginning to get to the other side or they're reimagining themselves after abuse. And we use the time today to dive into trauma responses and how we get stuck in trauma, understanding and really believing that an abusive relationship does cause trauma and how we can begin to soften our responses, to understand our responses and begin to calm down some of the triggers that we have. Of course, it's not our fault that we ended up in an abusive relationship or a traumatic situation, but I do feel like it's our responsibility to get to know ourselves and to begin to really be there for ourselves in these moments when things are feeling super triggering. I spend a lot of time working on my trauma triggers that could be based from past relationships. They could be based on childhood. And I feel like it's just a responsibility to learn how I show up so that I don't have to feel these heavy feelings all the time, but be able to understand them and work through them in a helpful and a useful way. So we'll talk a little bit about the various trauma responses, and we'll talk a little bit about healing the triggers around them. I hope that this episode is helpful to you. I hope that this episode helps you feel normal and validated. And as always, you can find me at Emotional Abuse Coach on Instagram. You can email me at jessica at jessicanightcoaching.com and my website, emotionalabusecoach.com. Hi, Emmy. Thank you so much again for joining me. Hi. Yes. Thank you so much for having me again. I wanted to just start with you, just introducing you, even though people may have listened to you before, just in case someone new is jumping on a little bit about you and what you do. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So my name is Emmy Marie. I am a certified trauma informed coach. And I also have some certifications in somatics, something called NARM, which is just related to complex trauma recovery. And I am also a trauma survivor myself. So my work came about as a response to my own personal journey of healing from an abusive relationship. And for the past three and a half years now, I've been working full time supporting clients on their healing journey. Yeah, so I do, you know, one on one coaching, I have some courses, I create a lot of content for social media with my handle blooming with Emmy. And I'm pretty much an open book. So super happy to elaborate on anything or answer any additional questions about that. But that's just kind of a little intro to who I am. Yeah, and I'm gonna have you like share all your links and where people can find you. But just as we were chatting just before, like one of the things that I really appreciated about the work that you do, I think it was about two years ago, I was in one of your courses. Yeah. It basically normalized trauma. And I think you said that in the first video that I remember, or at least that's how I remember conceptualizing it or writing it down in my journal is that it is okay that what we went through was trauma and we can acknowledge it. But when people come to you and they're maybe like second guessing that or the that fact, how do you validate that for them? That this That's a great trauma. question. Yeah. So I feel like language is kind of a tricky thing. And what's most important to me is just recognizing the impact that experiences have had on the human in front of me, whether they want to refer to it as trauma or not. But I do recognize there is certainly like a lot of gaslighting that goes on for survivors of things like emotional abuse or other experiences where there wasn't clear like physical evidence to point to to say that was traumatic um, or they lived in families or other environments that perhaps normalized the experiences they went through which have led them to you know not being able to really conceptualize it or call it trauma or abuse or whatever it is so yeah, like there's so many fantastic definitions of trauma out there that I've learned through the course of like my education. 
and just exploration of this field. But one that I learned within the last year from a practitioner called Anne Weiser Cornell, who has written books and done a lot of really good work with trauma is trauma can also be the result of our needs going chronically unmet. Mm. So instead of the you know DSM definition, which I think has to do more with like witnessing being a victim of violence or sexual assault or things like that, this definition of needs going chronically unmet can really encapsulate so many things that are traumatic for folks that they aren't seeing represented in other definitions of trauma. And like some examples of that, you know, what is a need that can go chronically unmet? There could be the need for love and care from your caregivers. Even if they are meeting your physical needs, if they are not showing you love or affection, that can lead to trauma. And I think that's referred to a lot as emotional neglect. Um, There's also the need to feel like you can be yourself, like you can be your authentic self, that you will feel safe and belong. And if you are, you know, being emotionally abused or bullied, that need is clearly going unmet. And so if those things continue, those examples, but other things certainly work with this framework as well. Like when that goes on for a very long time over and over and over again, it can, you know, change our brains and our nervous systems in an attempt to adapt to that and lead to the manifestations of what we call trauma. Yeah. And then trauma starts to show up in our lives. And I notice in my life, at least that like it starts with triggers. It starts with me being triggered by something, Mm -hmm. you know, me being either like frustrated or me feeling scared, me feeling questioning things and or me even just adapting or me not knowing what to say, like it comes up in all these ways. And then I typically have noticed that, especially at the beginning of my healing was that all I did was blame myself. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that comes up a lot. And so I would like to talk a little bit about how we can begin to recognize that we're in a trauma response, because one of the most helpful things that I learned in my own healing was that when we're in a trauma response, we're not thinking rationally, like that rational side of our brain turned off. And so to expect us to be thinking rationally, Like we can't, the pathways are not working in the way that they need to work right now, but that we can learn those triggers. We can find healthy responses when we are triggered to ourselves. And then obviously like begin to look at the trends that are coming up in our relationships or the patterns that are unhealthy and therefore like recognize abuse. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to talk a little bit more about the trauma responses. I'm going to think about the fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I guess before we get there, just to like bring it in a bit better, how do you define or look at triggers when we feel triggered, when we feel like that inner, like something's up, that agitation? Yeah. Awesome question. So yeah, for me, basically the definition of a trigger is something that's reminding our bodies or our nervous systems of something that happened in the past that was unsafe or threatening to our identity, to our well-being, to our literal existence. And so when a trigger happens, essentially our body is sensing with any number of senses, you know, sight, sound, taste, smell, anything, uh, sensing that there is something threatening in our midst. And our conscious or logical brains might look at that thing. Like this has happened to me numerous times when I'm on a walk and I smell, I smell a certain laundry detergent. I can logically know, okay, I am on a walk with my dog. There is absolutely nothing wrong, but I can get a really intense sense of doom in my stomach, for example. And that, you know, now with all the education I have, I understand is giving me information that, you know, I have come to understand. I think that laundry detergent was the one my ex, my abuser used. So my body remembers that really clearly, even though it was a long time ago and is trying to send me a message to stay safe. And so the four trauma responses we're going to get into are four manifestations of what people tend to do or how we try to achieve a sense of safety when we are faced with a trigger or something that's reminding us of something that was really horrific or terrifying in the past. It sounds like the one that I'm hearing is when you said that about the laundry detergent, like I almost like, um, like imagined walking down a street, having that smell and then I'm automatically like freezing, right? And being like so high about something. Yes. And so I tell people a very similar thing that these come into play when we want to keep, when our body's trying to keep us safe, like that it's responding to it, but we can invite that we can like allow the response to be there. There's nothing wrong with us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when that response comes in, 
and like we're freezing. Mm -hmm. What does that actually look like for our bodies? Like we are stuck. Right. How do you conceptualize beginning to like move through it? Because obviously like just telling Mm -hmm. someone you're being ridiculous. Right, right, right. right. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So I am not the best at recalling the literal physiological changes that happen in our bodies and brains. But conceptually, my favorite way to look at this is through the lens of the polyvagal theory, which was created by Dr. Stephen Porges. And it essentially describes this experience of being triggered through a metaphor of a ladder, where when we're at the top of the ladder, we are in what can be referred to as a safe and social nervous system state, where if problems arise, we're able to use collaboration, lean on other people, and find a solution without becoming dysregulated or what we would call triggered. And then as we go down the ladder, we are you know, sensing that the threat is too great for us to tolerate or accept, and our bodies get put into those modes of fight or flight. And I think fawn can definitely come in here as well. It's not used in the polyvagal theory, but in that fight or flight energy, our nervous system is sensing that there is a threat that we need to deal with. And so if we're more prone to fight, which in my understanding, some of us are conditioned towards some of these responses. Some of it is maybe more natural or innate. I'm not really sure. But with fight, we are getting the sense that we could move towards and fight off that threat. And I'm sure we can get into all the ways that can manifest. With flight, we are getting the message that we need to run away from the threat. And then if we're sensing that the threat is too great to face, eventually our bodies will go into a state of shutdown, which freeze is kind of like in between fight, flight, and shutdown. All out shutdown is when we're truly just preparing for death by feeling mm-hmm. as little pain as possible. And our, our bodies do all of this automatically as functions of our nervous system. But yeah, when it comes to trying to get out of these things, to me, it's like it can look in so many different ways depending on the person and the context around them. But I think the number one things that are helpful are just looking for something that provides you with a sense of safety. Mm-hmm. And so there's so many ways this can like look depending on how much awareness you have, how acute the trigger is, where you are. A simple one that I like to have on deck is, you know, if I'm finding myself getting triggered at some sort of event where I don't have access to all my tools or all my all the things that help me feel safe, like excusing myself to, you know, go sit in my car or go to the bathroom and just like having a folder on my phone of pictures that bring me a sense of connection or joy or being able to text a friend in those moments or something like that. But yeah, I'm going to stop going into specifics because there's so much, but ultimately navigating or reaching towards anything that helps you feel like in this moment you are safe because then your body can slowly but surely come back to a sense of being okay in the world. Yeah. And like, I think it goes from in that, in your response, it's like, it's a goes from us like this dysregulated state that we're in that like, we are likely also probably judging ourselves. We're mad at ourselves that we're in trauma response, but moving us back to a bit of peace, right. Of like, Mm-hmm. Like it be okay, and like how you said, go into the car. I used to go into like if I was out or something like that, I'd go to the bathroom, and I would might mm-hmm. take a little longer. Or this might sound gross, but I did it anyway. I would like find a place to sit on the floor, you know, even if I had to go sure. out, yeah, just ground myself back down because that, you know, when I go back to it, it's like that's actually what I did as a child when I felt unsafe mm-hmm. and I feel safe as I found a way to ground myself and I journal. So sometimes like it almost brings us back to the reality I think that we're in. And I really liked the idea of like what you said about like having a folder of these pictures that you might look at. And like, it just feels like it's a reminder that the experience that you're in, in that moment that's triggering or causing some of these, these responses go off that it's like, that's a moment. And this is a moment. And if I can differentiate mm-hmm then I can see, okay, this elicits these feelings. And if this person or this situation elicits these feelings, something that's important for us to look at. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it sounds like you're kind of describing what can happen when you start to just really bring like gentle awareness and compassion to yourself, your triggers and your nervous system instead of bringing judgment or shame or telling yourself it's bad to feel that way. Yeah, I think it can be really helpful to take the morality out of it basically and stop seeing 
triggers as some sort of moral failing or any failing of you or your character, or your strength, and instead see it as, you know, my body is sensing that I'm not safe for some reason. I logically know that doesn't appear to be true right now, but I can't just use logic to overpower my body. So I need to be more compassionate and gentle. And ultimately, you can learn a lot when you have these experiences of what you need in order to thrive moving forward. Yeah. And so I feel like a lot of people get hung up on the judgment of self for even having a trauma response. And I think sometimes that that is exemplified by an abuser's behavior too, of getting, of like making us bad for having trauma when obviously they have Mm -hmm. trauma too, you know, (laughs) but it's like, it causes, I think almost that lack of acceptance and of this is who I am and this is what I have and I can have responsibility for myself, but I don't have to judge my trauma responses. How can somebody begin to get to know what those triggers are rather than just Mm -hmm. judging them and being angry with themselves about it? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, one thing that's helped me a lot is just kind of diving into education around trauma in the nervous system. Because when you're reading a researcher or a therapist or someone that you look up to or admire or like believe when they talk about, you know, how trauma manifests itself in the body. For me, at least it can give me a sense of like, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not making this up. I'm not too sensitive. Like there's so many people that experience this. And that's kind of, you know, a big aim that I have with my content is just to allow people to see that they're not alone with these experiences. Because I think the more connected we feel to other people when we're suffering with whatever it is, you know, I'm always focusing on trauma really, but the more connected we feel, the less isolated and ashamed we feel. So that's one thing that helps for me as as far as like how to better understand yourself would be to just learn uh, like you are probably listening to this podcast episode right now, but diving into books or podcasts or Instagram content or wherever you feel most comfortable learning. So that's one way. So I'll stop there for now. But I mean, we could probably talk about more as well. Is there a book that you recommend as one of like a book or resource that you recommend that can be so helpful and just beginning to put some of those internal pieces together? Yeah, absolutely. So my favorite resource when people are like first wanting to understand like trauma in the nervous system is a podcast from Justin LMFT. Uh, So that stands for, I forgot, it's like his certification. But if you type in Justin LMFT on Google or on Spotify or whatever, you'll find his podcast. And Basically, at the when he first started the podcast, he did episodes breaking down all of the nervous system states. Yeah, um, so that's a pretty quick and easy way. But as far as books go, one that I really recommend because it's written so softly and gently is called "Try Softer" by Andy Kolber. Uh, I think that's how you pronounce her name. name uh, yeah, I love. Yeah, name. "Try Softer." It's so sweet. Obviously, yeah. there's things like the body keeps the score or waking the tiger, and those are very in depth and very scientific, but they're incredible resources. But yeah, those are some that come to mind. Yeah. For uh, now. And yeah. Go I ahead. have a client that used the body keeps score or like was reading the body keeps score. And just in case there are others who felt the same, she, like, I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent, excellent resource. Like you said, very scientific, but she also started to feel like, almost more shame towards herself for yeah. what oh. was existing yeah. in the body. And I was like, you know, maybe that's one of those resources that, you know, you only pick up when you when you can or you want to, but you can right. take and, you know, and I think talking about how our perfectionism shows up is another another thing, but it's more like, well, but just allowing yourself to treat your trauma responses with respect because most likely when you have been in fight, fight, freeze, I imagine that many people are also in this in while they are triggered dealing with someone telling them that they shouldn't be feeling that way. Mm -hmm. And so even allowing yourself to show up for yourself almost feels like it takes kind of some of what you were saying about can I disassociate from the the immediate trigger and bring myself back down to me, but also releasing Mm -hmm. of the judgment around that it's there and that we get to choose. We get to choose what resources resonate for us and also how we can. I read The Body Keeps Square years ago and I remember feeling like this book, it's very dense. There's so much in it. Like I learned so much, but I think that very newly 
discovering my trauma responses, it may have been one of those resources that might maybe like a too much too soon type of feeling. Yeah, same. I found a journal entry like not all that long ago. And it was like, I'm reading The Body Keeps the Score, which is both triggering and teaching me so much or something. I was like, okay, yeah. So yeah, I've definitely heard from people as well that that book can be um, overwhelming. So yeah, take caution. I would say go with what feels good to you. Another one that I really like is called The Trauma Toolkit. I don't think it's as well known, but it's more focused on like having a toolkit of resources to cope with healing from trauma. But there's definitely education in there as well about what trauma is and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like where like all where things land, or at least like it's like one of the first steps is like begin to understand how you respond to trauma and what your individual toolkit could be, Mm -hmm. which might feel overwhelming at first, but it's actually pretty empowering to be able to build yeah. your own toolkit and to have it yeah. and to feel yes, exactly. one of the responses. Right. It's a lot of work. Like none of this is easy and it can be really exhausting. So it's not like you have to focus entirely on these things, which is something I could have learned when I was younger. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it does. It is a way of taking such radical ownership for yourself and your well-being and to me, as a survivor of abuse, like learning to care for myself and advocate for myself and do what's right for me has ultimately been really healing and empowering because during an abusive relationship, all of that is completely demolished. At least it wasn't my experience. Yeah. Yeah. And the people that are in your community and your courses and that you work with, what are the trauma responses that you see most often? in people like even if they great question you can see it because obviously you you do this work right yeah so one thing that's unique about my work is you know unlike a trauma therapist I'm not really working with people who are in like active crisis mode type thing like I don't work with people who are actively in abusive relationships or um, Mm -hmm. are struggling with mental illness that is so debilitating that they're having a hard time functioning So typically when I'm working with folks, they have gotten to a place in life where they're able to, you know, function, like do things that like serve them and they're struggling in one way or another with the impact of trauma. And so I think that what I see the most in my clients is fawn and flight. Yeah. Some of the others certainly as well. Like honestly, I see them all and I've experienced them all absolutely too. But yeah, I think a lot of people with a more of a fond trauma response are drawn to work with me because I talk so frequently about people pleasing or codependency or anxious attachment. But essentially, for anyone who's curious, the fond trauma response is basically when we learn to mitigate harm or threat or pain through appealing to the person who is causing us harm or pain or could potentially be. So for example, in an abusive relationship, like the one I was in, I leaned on the fawn response extremely heavily because the message was very clear, you know, the fighting would make it worse. Mm -hmm. Running away felt impossible. So I was kind of left with when I had the energy for it, fawn, which was my attempt to please my abuser, make him happy, make myself be perfect. So then he would stop hurting me. And the other one that I leaned on a lot was freeze because that's kind of what happens when nothing else works or you don't have any capacity for anything else. But yeah, I think the fawn trauma response can show up in so many ways, including having a really hard time saying no, constantly feel like you're pleasing other people, being really intensely avoiding conflict, wanting everyone to love you all the time. It can become almost like a personality trait as well and certainly a big part of my story. So yeah, fawn is a big one. And then flight as well. Flight can come across looking like anxiety, a lot of sense of fear, avoiding anything that's going to cause us stress or potential harm, having a lot of perfectionism tendencies, being constantly worrying about what could go wrong. Yeah. So I've lived in that state for a very long time as well. So yeah, those are kind of the ones I see the most often. Yeah, I agree. I almost think that especially because I work with people that are in the abusive relationships and trying to leave Gotcha. a lot of the time and more so that than those who have left, but certainly a lot that have left. And I do think we have different responses. So I think when we're in it, it's a lot of fawning and a lot of freezing and the flight actually feels really scary. Like the wanting to run, mm. leave it feels yeah. terrible. But then right. when we are out of it, 
I've seen the same of more fawning, a lot of freezing, and sometimes the flight. And I think I saw flight mostly in myself in not wanting to look at a lot of the stuff that I had experienced and work through it in any way to be able to be in a relationship again, because it was like, it was too scary. Like I wanted to run away from the own my own pain. Mm-hmm. And instead, that just it manifested in other ways, obviously, like, you know, in the way that trauma gets stored within us. But I think that with clients that are in it, when clients that are in an abuse relationship now, I think the fawning comes into play almost the most. And I think a lot of people don't know what yeah. fawning is. Like totally. we're still hearing flight freeze. Like we know exactly right. what it's like. Yeah, we're totally. Appeasing this person just to prevent the abuse or even doing different behaviors in our life after still self, like in a way self-soothing through fawning, but not realizing it, not being able to break those, break it apart. Right. It's interesting. It's obviously so worthwhile to look at and to detangle, but when we're in it, it feels hard and it feels like this is just the way it, this is just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, all of these can really be taken on as a new reality, especially if you're in ongoing traumatic circumstances that put you into the state. It can feel like this is all there is. And if we think about the whole concept of a lot of abusers being trauma survivors, we yeah. can think about that fight response of, you know, if you learn from a very young age that like you need to fight to get any of your needs met or like that's, you know, what you're more prone to, like that can be multiplied and taken and projected onto other people when you grow up and find someone to have power or control over. So none of that excuses that behavior, but it's interesting to think like I know many survivors, including myself, have moments when we're activated or triggered and lash out in a fight response and say yeah. things you don't mean or act in a way that you would never want to act towards this person that you love and care about because your nervous system is telling you, you are not safe right now. You need to like fight them off. So yeah, it's like there's a lot of shadow stuff to all of this, but certainly all of these things can kind of become internalized as feelings that are perhaps impossible to escape, which is, yeah, really painful and hard. Yeah. And since you work with people, mostly people that are like realize, you know, almost like either like looking back and realizing what they have gone through or like working through how this stuff is still existing in their lives and in their body and they're like, they're starting to notice it and feel it and they want to be more aware of it. If someone's not even aware that they're in a trauma response, what are some of the things they might be experiencing? Like, for example, just so you know, like what I'm thinking about, like the chronic exhaustion was one for me. Mm-hmm. Of, like, why am I am old? Like, can't yeah. deal with tired. You know, mm-hmm. what are some of the things that we may push away as normal stuff, but they are actually trauma responses? Yeah, that's a great question. I have hmm, a few other examples. Right. Helpful, if that's helpful. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, always feeling tired, unmotivated is definitely one that I see a lot. Unable to concentrate or make decisions because like we are afraid of of making decisions because you've sort of been taught in the relationship mm-hmm. that you be afraid to be like, or any decision you make is going to cause a reaction mm-hmm. from someone. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I have something I could add if that's yeah. okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, okay, <laughs> cool. Yeah, about this like, sort of constant fear of having even like an opinion like I feel like me and many people I know yeah it's just like sort of panicking if someone like asks like no where do you want to go to eat or like what do you want to do it's just like I can't like I can't answer because there's a chance you're not going to like it and you're going to get mad at me and you're going to hurt me and it's like you're talking to hopefully a safe person at this point who is like I just want to get to know you better but there can be so much like fear coupled with having any kind of yeah opinion need want desire thought um so that's kind of connected to like people pleasing another one is i think you're you kind of touched on as well is like this constant sense of urgency which is something that i've dealt with where it's like everything is a big deal and everything needs to be taken care of now because yeah like in, in the relationship i was in uh that was abusive it's like everything was urgent. Like when there, when he was, something was wrong for him. It was, I had to deal with that right now. Like I had yeah. no time to think I had no time to 
breathe. It was just like, dote on him and figure it out or else bad things are about to happen. So like that can get taken into the workplace. It can get taken into healthy relationships, friendships, me owning my own business. That's been a whole thing is just like realizing like I don't have to constantly work. I don't have to constantly think about work. I don't always have to try to like put out fires that don't even exist. Like you know, it's okay to like trust um, or slow down or breathe. And, uh, but yeah, I find it gets heightened a lot for me when conflict is arising in one way or another. It's like the idea of just like not um, solving something right away can feel very foreign if that was the role you were in in the past. Right. I think that I definitely see that come up a lot. I'm sure a lot of people also experience that another another one that like around your sense of urgency that like might be just making it a bit more specific but i i see a lot is that when people feel the need to respond right away when they get a text from someone like I even oh know, yeah oh that's me yeah yeah right or like you can't go to bed with unless all the responses have been made and it's yeah. that definitely comes from that right but like most likely totally. the user didn't prioritize responding to us which is no. you know so we've created this right. response because it was something we hated right. so much or like we still were held to that standard yeah. yes. but it doesn't allow <laughs> us to relax so I do still work with her I was thinking about somebody else but somehow I have a client that has exactly this issue is that if she doesn't respond to her partner like if he say he even messages like I love you and she's like on a work call in a meeting with a friend doesn't mm-hmm. respond it turns into an issue every time mm-hmm. You know, we've talked through strategies and try and find ways, but I think like on our one-on-one work, I can give the, her the reminder of like, you have the right to be in your own life, right? Like you don't yes. have to just respond to whatever he wants yep. in these ways. You can be in your world. But I imagine that when she's on the other side of this, that's going to come up quite a bit of feeling like right. I have to respond right away or else there's a consequence. Totally. Yeah. And so that's a great example of like, if that happened and you know, you felt that really intensity of like, I need to respond to this. Like if that invites you to, you know, have some compassion for yourself of like the younger version of yourself that had to literally did have to respond that fast or else, you know, shit was going to hit the fan. It's like, I personally feel so much compassion towards anyone that's experienced that, including my younger self. And I think through that compassion, we can find breakthroughs and ways forward and healing So yeah, I would say I would encourage that over like being really harsh and intense about it or believing that, yeah, you do have to respond that fast because yeah, the truth is you should be able to breathe a little bit and not just be so preoccupied with your communication to someone else. Yeah. I really love what you said about if someone resonates with this, sees it in themselves or notices it, that they like having more of that compassion to themselves and younger self that we often forget about and kind of cast aside, but that, that younger self that did these things out of survival, you know, that made it this far, but that needs some new tools. Mm -hmm. Maybe she wants some new tools, right? Like the the self (laughs) that's here now, the way I guess I think about it is like the self that's here today. I wish that I could give that former self better tools, you know, rather than the ones I had, or maybe some awareness, but, or even just the compassion of it's okay this happened and like we're not there anymore and we can I can heal those parts yes absolutely I love all of that yeah I guess when you think about beginning to soften our trauma responses like I know you shared Mm -hmm. here are some tools that like are possible to do and if you're feeling the trigger coming on like but first Mm -hmm. sounds like First, educate yourself so you're aware about what's happening and that you can show up a bit better for yourself. And then would you say, like, the second thing is, I I think you've said this without really saying it, is that just really being softer with yourself and, like, mm-hmm. accept, almost like allowing it to be there, accepting mm-hmm. it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, so I feel like the, you know, off the top of my head, like, first of all, there is no, like, perfect framework of how to deal with a trigger, but... Obviously, it's helpful to have some idea or some structure. I feel like what can be really helpful is starting by just like noticing, naming how you're feeling, like, Mm -hmm. you know, sensing like, okay, I'm feeling this tightness in my chest. I'm feeling this drop in my stomach. You know, that feels like anxiety. That feels like fear. That feels like terror. That feels like I'm starting to shut down. 
or I'm feeling really angry. I'm feeling like I really want to like lash out, like noticing any urges, noticing anything that's, you know, any movement within you that's compelling you to do something and try to, you know, take a pause there if you can. And so I think that pause can look a number of different ways. You could do some like intentional kind of breathing. Uh, One thing that can be helpful is sighing or Mm -hmm. exhaling for a lot longer than you inhale. That can help activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which tells us we're safe. It can be helpful to, if you're feeling really activated, especially if you're feeling very angry or wanting to lash out or very anxious, doing some sort of movement, whether that's like shaking or punching a pillow or dancing or going on a walk or a run, like kind of like moving your body to expel that energy. I think that's typically what I'm usually drawn for. Um, I'm someone that's less in the freeze state sort of things where, you know, some people really can feel totally immobilized. Usually for me, triggers manifest either as like intense irritation or typically more as anxiety. And so moving that energy through the body really intentionally can be helpful. I also think moving our thoughts can be helpful. So things like journaling, talking to someone you trust or someone that supports you or any other way you have of kind of expressing how you feel in a way that's safe can be super helpful. And then, yeah, as we've been naming, being compassionate with yourself sensing into like I kind of think that within us all we we have a lot of information about what we need but it's hard to get to that information if you're being really critical or shaming towards yourself or if someone else is being that way towards you so if you can create an inner environment that says hey like I I see you're feeling this way I you know like uh, I'm sorry you're feeling this way what would feel good right now? Like so much can come forward from within us. Another thing I haven't really named yet is connection. So connecting with someone that feels like a balm to your soul or like someone that affirms to you, you are in the present moment, you are safe, whether that's holding hands with them, getting a hug or not touching at all, just talking, calling them on the phone, uh, even watching a TV show that has your favorite characters in it or reading your comfort book, like all of that can really help us feel more present in our bodies and less unsafe. Yeah. When you were saying that, one thing that came up for me is just like having space from the trigger. Like, a, or like, mm, yeah, totally. That trigger, like just allowing mm-hmm. yourself that I don't have to continue to be in the fire in order to work through this. I can let yes. myself the fire yes. and have space and like almost like re regulate my body. Um, I have a child yes. and they use the word regulation all the time to talk about like just regulated and regulated. And I know on a former. Aww. I, I shared the colors with you, like the stop sign colors. Oh, like, yeah. That's yeah, awesome. Yellow zone. Yeah. I like that because it's like, okay, when I'm starting to get heightened, I can start to recognize like uh-huh. this, like this is not okay. And when I have space, right. what you said, like I'm able to sort of come back down to, okay, now that I've had time and space, like at least Ian, which could be, it could be a whole day away or it could just be literally like I went home and then went back and finished doing the thing I needed to do. If we use the laundry example, like, okay, I was at the laundromat and like, maybe I decide I'm going to move my stuff to another laundromat because I don't want right. to smell the smell. Right. Have, right. You know, we don't have to right. sort out every single trigger in that moment. You also might decide you never want to smell that, that, you know, that scent again. Yeah. Right. It and, right. somewhere else. and that right. just feels it's like your choice. Um, Exactly. That's exactly it. It's a choice, which in this framing that, you know, you're, I think you're giving us, it's like, if we're going to stay away from judging ourselves, then we can also stay away from like, like we get to make these choices. Yes. Right. Exactly. And it's like, if it's, you know, for some people, it's important for them to confront things and not avoid everything that causes them triggers. Right. And then for some people, it's important to learn that you do not have to tolerate being triggered if you have the capacity to leave, you know, so it's up to you. um, And what feels right, what feels most aligned for you, I guess, wherever you're at in your journey of whether you want to find a way to tolerate something or whether you want to move on and walk away, which I am in full support of. (laughs) Yeah, I remember like kind of framing it this way when I was younger of like, I just don't like I'm just not about to deal with that right now, you know, or like just being like, yep. And other people would almost take it as like, I was being a bit dismissive of like things I was dealing with. But I know now looking back, it was really, it's more, it was more of like, this is what I can handle right now. I can handle working on this, 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 and this, but like that pile of stuff over there, I'm good. You know, like, 
Like right. sometimes I right. tell right. the story to my clients. Like I had an ex that lived in like a downtown area, a pretty prominent area. And I just, I kind of just don't want to go there. You know, he doesn't live there anymore. Yeah. It feels a bit better now, but I have no need to go there. So why would I, I remember saying to somebody like, I want to get myself to be able to go there that as I healed, yeah. I didn't care anymore. That yeah. was like, yeah. that was like version one for my, of myself. I was like, I want to get to be able to go to this place. And then as I, I think I worked on it, I was like, why do I have that? Do I want to? And yeah. then it turned into like more of a choice to just say, no, I don't. Right. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I feel like at the heart of so much of the healing process from particularly like controlling abusive type relationships or dynamics is you get to have choice again. So it's not about what you should do. It's about, you know, what you choose to do, what you want to do, what works for you. And so I love that. I love when I see people getting in touch with that and yeah. Allowing themselves a choice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like a lot of your content that I mean, I'm sure I see what I want to see, you know what I mean? But I feel like a lot of mm-hmm. your content is focused a lot on like that we don't have to feel these ways. Like we can make a choice. We can acknowledge that this happened. We can accept that this is part like this may have happened and this is part of our story, but it's also it's we can heal. And that reminder of like it's almost like it's okay. It's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, there's right. there's people that have gone down this path and we can feel there we can feel better and here are some ways we could feel better and Mm -hmm. that's what I've really gotten from following your work and being a part of your programs is like first the education of this is what's going on for me this is how I can notice Mm -hmm. it but also here's I don't have to be mad at myself anymore Mm -hmm. yeah great yeah totally like I really like to push back against the idea that you have to be like fully healed or free of trauma responses in order to have healthy relationships or a meaningful life because it's not true like you know i i was a person with so much trauma and you know got into the relationship that i'm in now that is extremely healthy and very secure and that's yeah. just one example but it's like we it doesn't have to be all or nothing and so focusing on feeling better tending to yourself nurturing yourself all of that is so lovely and wonderful and it doesn't have to come at the price of shaming yourself or telling yourself you're bad or wrong yeah you can be compassionate and still pursue a better life or feeling better in your in your brain and your body yeah and you shared in a previous podcast too that your current partner um your husband right Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that he really gave you the space and the compassion to really be able to heal the you know the parts of you that you wanted to heal in the relation that offered a lot of like enough space for you to be able to like look at acknowledge take care of mm-hmm. you needed to and which probably also helps facilitate the ability for you to be in the relationship too yes absolutely yeah definitely getting into that relationship i required a lot of space um, yeah 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 it worked out really well so i'm very grateful yeah. for that <laughs> yeah yeah as a fellow space needer i totally that's, <laughs> that probably says something about like what you and i experience as in the abuse is that we didn't have the space you know to like be our zero own. space yeah. yeah zero space exactly. yeah if people want to explore more about what you do and especially like with this idea of like if they are going to if they want to like learn more about their triggers their trauma mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about the courses and the groups that you have. Cool. Yeah. So on my website, emmymarie.com, you can find a number of free resources I have. I have one that's all about how trauma impacts relationships. Um, one is more like a inquiry into your symptoms and kind of like a self-compassionate guided journal type deal. Um, and then beyond that, I have a monthly membership that is like sliding scale. So it's a lower cost. Mm -hmm. And that has a lot of different workshops within it related to trauma and recovery. So you can find some education in there related to triggers, trauma responses, everything we've been talking about, and a lot more. Uh, Beyond that, I have a course for relationships after trauma that opens again this spring at some point. And then I have another one called Coming Home to Yourself that's more about embracing authenticity when you've um, kind of been conditioned to hide yourself or suppress your true self. 
And then I do also one-to-one work as well for folks who are wanting to, you know, dive in. Yeah. Just with, just in a private space. Well, yeah, a lot, some a lot of places reach. to get to know yeah. better and also to work through these tough things that I always think that working on it with somebody who understands it from that like deep way of like, I've gone through this and I've had to work through all the tough parts and I've gotten to the other, <laughs> gone to the other side, you know, is like, it's so valuable. And I'm glad that you yeah. have different options and choices so that if someone where they, they can really start where they are. Yeah. Yeah. It works for me in the way my brain works when it comes to like offering things in a business. And I also like how it can reach a lot of different people depending on where they're at and what they need. So thank, thank you for your kind words. <laughs> thank you, Emmy. I really enjoyed having you again. And I'm yeah. sure back um, in the future, maybe in the spring when Aww. your course is coming out, you know, we can do something else, but Thank you. And I'm sure some people are going to be headed to your courses and your page. Aw, well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And yeah, anyone that's listening, thank you for listening. I know this work can really take so much courage to dive into. So I just want to say I think you're very brave and absolutely worthy of all the good things that come along with healing, despite how difficult it can be as well. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Emmy. Thank you.